Tyler, it's good to see you. It's been a while, my friend. It has. It has. Great to be back on the PRFC Fan Show podcast with the one and only Kevin Gates to the Key. Keys to the Gate. Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. You know, actually, what I'm going to title this uh, this uh, particular episode is One Honest Lad and Tyler Terrence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and then you'll be hearing from my lawyer. His name's Devin Kerr, and he's never practiced law a day in his life. <laughs> uh, all you got to do is throw a can of Bud Light at him. He'll be good. <laughs> throw 17, and he'll be really good. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say belated happy birthday. I just saw on Twitter a couple minutes ago. It was your birthday. Um, it was. Thank you. Appreciate that. A lot of big milestones. You've graduated from uh, farm animals to an actual homo sapien. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> the goats and sheep yeah, in Florida yeah. will be very thankful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, as you can tell, I listen to your podcast religiously. I gobbled up yesterday's pod. I mean, it hadn't been out probably 10 minutes. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great, great show. A uh, ton of fun. You guys do a great job. Uh, you do need to sedate Devin every once in a while, I think. But you yeah, know. but you know, but sometimes you want to let him run rampant with the other farm animals. You know, like that's. I feel like sometimes <laughs> you just need to let Devin be exactly who Devin is. Uh, but no, thank you. We we appreciate. It. We listen. We modeled our show after after the best. I mean, yeah. Devin and I didn't have our own pod before we were you know regulars on the PRFC fan show. So uh, yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> you went. Your Here's great grandpa's pod. <laughs> I appreciate it. And Sam's big, to, big is a big addition to the show too. Love his perspective. He's a blast. Um, he just needs to get his butt. What is it out of referee school that he's in right now? Is that where he is? So he actually moved back to England. So he's no longer, I don't know if one of the pods, we, uh, we explained it at the beginning of the, of the show that he actually moved back to England and like, won't be a regular part of the, of the pod anymore. So. Oh, I need to, then I've missed something somewhere. I need to, uh, I need to recheck myself. Um, so what I want to do is, um, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. I want to talk a little bit about Phoenix Rising and the, and the run they're on. And a couple of observations I have. Um, and based on your conversation with Devin yesterday, especially the East West Coast thing, because um, I really enjoyed what was going on there. Um, so first off, I am going to give you shit because... Yeah, you were way off on that Austin gay man. <laughs> you were a big man. You were a big man and admitted it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, listen, I mean, yes, I was off in terms of the final scoreline, but I will stick by the fact that I do think that had Sion McFarland not come out of that game, I think it would have been totally, totally, totally different because mm -hmm. Junior Flemings was not good in the first half. I think everybody can agree on that. And then as soon as Sion comes out, London Woodbury comes on, and it's just a disaster. How is it that you would describe that, that Fleming started drooling or something like that when, yeah, when he saw him yeah, get on the field? Just lit up, yeah. <laughs> I lit up. I mean, that guy, that guy literally went from, you know, like, oh, it's another game, Phoenix, you know, just trying to get back into the swing of things. Like, I'm going to terrorize this poor kid for, for, the, for the rest of the game. Um, um, yeah, I was wrong. Listen, I'm happy to be wrong if it means, you know, that I thought it was going to be a close game. I still thought the Phoenix were going to get the win, but, uh, no, I didn't, I certainly didn't think six nil. Um, it's kind of getting ridiculous. And Devin and I throughout the entire broadcast were just sort of, we're, we're, we were literally running out of things to say. I mean, how many superlatives can I say? Oh, that's sensational, magnificent, spectacular. It gets old at this point. I was saying to somebody else from the league, you know, they texted me, they were like, Oh, great goal calls on the other night. I was like, I feel like I'm running out of stuff for Phoenix because like, you guys score incredible goals, like, in a stretch of, like, a two- or three-game period that, like, other teams won't score for the entire season. So, like, I feel like I use what would be normally my best goal calls for you guys in a stretch of, like, minutes, and then, and then I don't know what to do for the rest of the season. What you need to do is you need to tweet out that you need help figuring out adjectives. <laughs> That's what I should do. I should just have a thesaurus just, like, right, just – handy and Devin, Devin can just read me off words as we go along through the broadcast there you go well I do want to get into the tactics but I want to kind of keep it at the macro level for a second because I loved your conversation about east versus west and I totally bought into what you guys are saying um I think it's probably the best analysis of USL championship league we've had yet from anyone um and there's some good guys out there Joe and Cleats you know does a great job um a, a couple of others uh, but what, what you guys said, I hadn't really thought about it, 
But when it comes to the defense on the East Coast versus the defense on the on the West Coast, um, as you say, without taking anything away from Phoenix Rising, there does seem to be a, a difference in quality and defense. What little I see of the East Coast um, or the uh, the Eastern Conference. Um, and so it's, it got me thinking because I went back to Louisville, right, and started thinking about the game in Louisville and, and how different the gameplay was. Um, when it comes to, let's say, if it is Tampa Bay Rowdies, you know, which is kind of the what-if scenario you guys, you guys hit, how do you see Tampa Bay Rowdies today, their defense, matching up with Phoenix Rising? Um, well, I mean, listen, when we're talking about the East versus West, um, it, it's not only to not take anything away from Phoenix Rising, but the Phoenix Rising is the exception. Because if you look at if you look at what Phoenix has done, obviously, from an offensive standpoint, having a plus 35 goal differential is ridiculous. But then if you look at it for the decent defensive side of the ball, Zach Lubin is leading, you know, leading the league in clean sheets and in goals against average, which is absurd. And when we talked to Rick, you know, I asked him two or three weeks ago, if you could pinpoint one thing as the catalyst for this winning streak, what would it be? Is it, you know, Junior and Solomon and Adam John really starting to finally click? Is it the removal of the LAFC guys? I mean, like, you know, you could sort of decipher that on your own. Or, you know, what is it? And he goes, 95% of what we've done, we can attribute to the defensive side of the ball and our new approach. Um, so with that said, Phoenix is the exception. The rest of the Western Conference, even Fresno, who's, deemed a defensive sign in the West still, you know, has difficulty tracking vertical runners and, and, and certain things here and there. With regard to Tampa Bay, they defend in very, very different ways. I mean, Tampa Bay, like, will sit in a deep block, absorb some pressure. They're not going to sit back, but they just sort of absorb and they draw a deeper line of confrontation, whereas Phoenix, as you see, it just falls to the wall and they're just going to go after you, right? Like, they, they move the line up. They expose their center backs and their outside backs and Amadidia, Mustafa Nambuya and the like. But they know that 1v1 for pace, not many people are getting around Mustafa and Amadidia. So they're okay with that. And they are okay with the pace of AJ and Joey and Duigi, whoever's paired up at center back. So mm -hmm. the defensive side of the ball is very different for those two teams. How they compare, it's so difficult to tell because we, we, we have no measuring stick for East versus West throughout the year, right? There's no interconference games. MLS has them all the time. But that's because there's only 20-some-odd teams. In the USL, you have 36. I mean, you're just trying to play every team within your own conference three times, let alone playing teams from the other conference. Yep. So um, it, it's difficult to say. I, I mean, I would venture to say that, like, they, they stack up against each other nicely. And again, as Devin said, the, if that is the final, that, that'll be an unbelievable final because between the attacking prowess of Phoenix and the different ways that they defend, it would make for an incredible match of football. Like, one of those Premier League games where you hear Arlo White or whoever, Peter Drury, just say, like, this is the best game of the year. Like, the ebbs and flows of it. Ten minute, you know, like a five to ten minute spell of possession for one team, five to ten minute spell of possession for the other. Just the game flowing perfectly back and forth. Not many cheap giveaways in the back. Like, we would have one of those games. Uh, but if you go back to the USL Cup final in Louisville, I mean, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, um, you still have Didier Drogba on the field. That's a good thing and it's a bad thing. If you look at Phoenix this year compared to last year, obviously with Didier on the field and not on the field, it's very different. Phoenix, I mean, the work rate from Jose Aguinaga, the work rate from James Musa, Kivan Lambert, um, Junior Flemings, like the, these guys cover ground. Listen, we all love Didier and knows what, know, know what he did for the game, but sure. you know, he, he, he didn't cover ground. And nope. that's the biggest thing about this Phoenix side. So it, it would be an incredible, incredible mm -hmm. USL Cup final if it were Tampa Bay and Phoenix, if it were on either... You know, if we're at Al Lang or Casino Arizona Field, both are terrific playing services. I know you guys would obviously love to host the final. And I'll tell you what, if it's gonna, if it's out in Phoenix, I will be there. If it's in Tampa, I will be there. One of them's, <laughs> gonna, be, one of them's gonna be much cheaper for me, but you know, like it, it'll be, it'll be an awesome game either way. You know, I really do look forward to seeing some of this, uh, this crossover play happen. You know, unfortunately, it just happens way too late in the season. Um, do you feel like at some point the USL will create some kind of a cup or championship, you know, whatever, that we do get a little bit of uh, crosstalk, especially if the MLS2 teams are going to start going down to League One? Yeah, so that's that, I think that's the biggest um, key right there is that if all those teams get forced out um, and, and with some of the expansion sides coming into the championship, then – probably you, you can start to see maybe just some more crossover games. I don't think you'd have a cup or anything like that because, um, you know, it, it would be one of those things where you're basically just having a USL cup 
final like every I mean it would be cool yes but um I mean if you look at it from an interleague cup standpoint where if you involve league one league two in the championship and you make it an open tournament as opposed to like the U.S. Open Cup where it's regionally based that's something I would I would be really interested in right so if you have if you have USL league two and league one teams battling out first and second round or even if you have all the teams competing in the opening rounds from the get-go and you don't have it based on the where you are in the country, you just it's it's a random open draw. I think that's where you would get like that that would be the biggest thing. I don't think it would be something where it's like just a league cup amongst um the USL championship. Because I think that, that would be too many games because you already have too many teams. The reason Premier League is able to do that is because there's only twenty teams. Thirty gotcha. teams in the USL championship. I mean that's a yeah. scene. It's 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 overload for sure. Um, you know, and it's kind of, it's a bit of a shame, but you know, it is, it is what it is. I, uh, I have a hard time carving out time to watch the the West coast games. I want to see, let alone the East coast. So now I'm going to try and divvy up time. You guys really got me interested in watching what the rowdies are doing. Um, and even Bethlehem steel, you guys said something. I can't remember what it was today or today, what you said yesterday, but I thought, damn, I got to watch a Bethlehem Steel game just because. <laughs> hold on. I mean, hold on a second. I, I, you don't need to watch a Bethlehem Steel game. Listen, Devin and I love Brendan Burke. Like, he's done incredible things over there. And he's just a great, great young head coach. And he's going to get a job elsewhere, I think. Um, you know, not to say that he might leave Bethlehem or the Philadelphia Union organization in the next year or two. He might. I don't know. But basically what we were saying is that if you look at Bethlehem in the way that they operate from last year and even the two years before that to this year under Ernie Stewart, who's now the GM for the U S men's national team. And now under Ernst Tanner, who's the sporting director, they've shifted from the Bethlehem steel being an opportunity for some of the older, younger players. If you're catching my drift, there, like uh-huh. 19 through 22 to get experience. And, and, you know, they're competitive, but now it's like, Let's shell out the 15, 16, 17 year olds and just get them experience no matter what the cost, even at the cost of losing most games. But Bethlehem went into Louisville and got the first ever win against Louisville, a team that's beaten them twice in a row in the postseason, 2017 in the quarterfinals, 2018 in the semifinals. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're an interesting team to watch because they do have an incredible amount of young talent. But more times than not, they're shelling out a lineup that just isn't conducive to winning in the championship. Interesting. Um, a lot of personality over there on the East Coast, but we we do want to. I do want to go back to PRFC because I'm. I'll I'll just go on 15 tangents. Yeah. Um, so Kevon Lambert's been out. Uh, Junior Fleming's is out. Junior came back. Kevon, uh, you you probably saw Rick told the Jamaican national team he wants his player back. Now we've got this conflict, right? Because we got James Musa who's been delivering every game consistently. Got a goal in the last game. Doing well. Kevon's coming back, and you know I'm a huge Lambert fan. I love Kevon Lambert. Who isn't? Yeah. Um, what do you think happens there? The, I mean, there's there's conflict there. How does that shake out? So, I mean, if you just look at it across the board and what's happened, whether players get sick, whether they get hurt during this stretch, next man up. I mean, like, if you, if you make a mistake or if you just happen to miss a game, look at A.J. Cochran. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to the last broadcast, but – AJ got sick, got the stomach flu, literally like less than 24 hours before the RGB game. He was slated to start. So then it ends up being Duigi and Joey who get to start at the center back position. And then you go into the Austin game, and who's starting? Duigi. Because Duigi did well. You get a shutout at HEB, and you, and you win 1-0. Rick is not a type of coach to just go with the best player just because, Right. Kevon Lambert, over a stretch of time, has proved his body of work is more impressive than James Moose's. But right now, in this moment, Rick Schantz is a "What have you done for me lately?" kind of coach, and mm-hmm. it's no fault of it's no fault of Kevon Lambert's, it's no fault of AJ Cochran's, but they just happen to not be in the lineup for whatever reason, whether it be national team duty or getting a stomach flu. So Rick Schantz is going to stick, given on what he's done recently, he is going to stick with Musa until Musa makes a mistake. Just like when Waz won the starting goalkeeper position at the beginning of the season, he stuck with Waz until Waz made a mistake. Isjom, 91st minute against Colorado Springs. Waz comes off of his line, or shouldn't have come off of his line, and he, do- and he makes a mistake. In steps Zach Lubin, and now it's a guy who's vying for the Golden Glove. And Zach has been terrific. It's not like Zach is one of those keepers in the Eastern Conference who doesn't see any shots. Zach has to make a couple of big saves every single game just because of the positions that Phoenix put themselves in when they're keeping the ball and then maybe make a couple mistakes at the back, but that's okay. So he's going to stick with Musa 
until Musa proves that he can't handle that position for one particular instance, in steps Lambert, Lambert does what he does, and then you'll probably resume normalcy. But if Musa continues to go on this run and plays well, you could see a stretch of like six, seven, eight, nine, ten weeks of Musa starting. And then if Musa gets a knock, an injury, he gets suspended due to yellow card accumulation, whatever it might be, in steps Lambert, then it's Lambert's position to lose, which is like it's a philosophy from Rick that I just absolutely love. And it just goes to show the depth of Phoenix and how much they've invested in this roster. You know, I tweeted out the other day uh, something about how uh, Rick has this boy next door personality, you know, calm, cool, collected, quiet, right? But inside of that, he is tough as friggin' nails. Yep. Um, and it just shines through the team. And he's made other tough calls in the past, and he continues to do so. I mean, this is the best problem he could have. He's got two quality midfielders vying for a position. Um, but like you said with Lubin, he made that decision, didn't hesitate. Didn't regret it, just moving on. Um, the coaching, you know, when, when Phoenix Rising fans were doubting Rick at the beginning of the season, I, I just stuck by it. I'm like, you know what, I, I see something in this guy. I really think he's going to take it where it is. And uh, to his credit, I think between him making the tough choices, coming up with the right scheme, and working so well with both Blair Gavin and Peter Ramage, I mean, this thing is, is just flying. And it's not because... Um, you know, we, we are, we're not playing top teams because we are, and we're playing t- top teams and we're going into there, you know, like Reno, we went into their house and beat them three, nothing, right. Yeah. Uh, we go to RGV, you know what they'll do. They'll just park it in that horrible stadium with that horrible weather. Right. And they'll just be like, bring it. Right. Yeah. And, and we pulled it off, uh, some, somehow, uh, I interviewed, um, uh, Mustafa yesterday, uh, Mustafa Domboya. What a great guy. I'm sure you've talked to him multiple times in the past. Um, He is an incredible individual. And I was talking to him and I was like, okay, so we've got Tulsa coming up this weekend. They're in next to last place. Is this where the team becomes, you know, a little bit complacent? Just, you know, just rolls in thinking they're going to come with a win? Oh, yeah, he got all in my craw. (laughs) As, as, As he should. That's... Yep. I mean, well, I, you know, I was kind of egging him on with the whole thing, right? Because I know that this team is hyper-focused, but then I pushed it another level. And I said, well, I can see you guys making this run. And I pulled a number out of the air. I was like, you know, I, I can see us getting to like 16 wins, you know, and then and maybe the streak ending. Oh, no, he had none of that, man. He's like, we want to take this. We're looking at the end. We're looking to make a run all the way to the end of the season. And the personality that comes out of him and the things that he says about Rick and the team is so different than what it was last year. We were good last year, but it's like that whole, and I'm going to use a horrible cliche, eye of the tiger type of thing where the team is just hyper-focused, fighting for their positions, putting 150% out on the pitch every single game. If I were Tulsa, I'd I'd be really worried about what's going to happen in in my house uh, this weekend. I mean, every every team's worried about what's going to happen in their house when Phoenix come to play. I mean, the USL Western Conference meme Twitter account is like, you know, they put out a GIF. What you know, it's like when Phoenix Rising comes to play uh, your club, and it was like a positive GIF. But it's like, yeah, you might sell some tickets, but you're probably not going to get a result. Like that's just the way that it's going to go at this point. But <laughs> I mean. Yeah, like as for what what you're saying is, you know, you're you're expecting a trap game at some point, right? You know, it's like any NFL team, it's like, you know, the Patriots or whoever the best team in the game is, like goes in to an NFC team who's in last place in their division on the road, and it's a trap game, and they lose, and you know, like it's not a result that you expected. But with Phoenix right now, and again, and you you mentioned it, the training I, I think is the biggest piece because what we talked about earlier, and 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 the, and the carousel that can be this lineup. If, if you take a day off from training, I mean, like, listen, we can see the mistakes that happen in the game, but if you take a day off from training, I mean, Rick Shops is going to be more inclined to, to give the position to somebody else who who brings it every single day in training. So, again, it's like, you know, those it's like those Chicago Bull teams back in the 90s where they always said that practices were more tough than the games. And because Phoenix invested so much money in this roster and that you could probably put together a team that would be competitive in the Western Conference outside of the starting 11, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get training sessions where the other 11 guys that are going up against the first team are worthy opponents and not only worthy opponents, but could probably beat them, you know, on, on any given day. So it just makes it that much more intense. And 
listen, you know, they're going to go into Tulsa and uh, Phoenix has a very good history against Tulsa just in general. Um, I mean, if you remember the last time that they went there, um, that was Drugba from about like, you know, 50 yards out with the free kick. And oh, um, yeah, that was the Tulsa game. That was oh. at Tulsa. Yeah, that was at Tulsa. Okay. Kobe Wakasa scored. Um, <clears throat> Kev Lambert had a goal. Um, so they, they have a very good history against them in general. And Tulsa obviously has not been very good this season, except for like the first three or four weeks of the season when Luca Lobo had like seven goals and was leading the Golden Boot race. We see how that panned out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not particularly worried about them going into this game. Um, again, it's just like at this point, it doesn't matter who you're playing, but because you have that record in sight, and especially this, this is the record-setting game, there's no chance that they you know, come in napping or, or underestimate their opponent or whatever it might be. And listen, they're in a great position right now just in terms of their schedule because there's not many midweek games right now. They're going weekend, weekend, weekend. I mean, you have time to work on things. You have time for guys to lick some wounds. Um, they're, they're just a really good spot right now. I will say this. I can understand them wanting to take it all the way through. But like we saw with FC Cincinnati, it was an unbeaten streak of God knows how many. And then they go in and they end up falling to New York Rebels too. Now, New York Rebels too has had a very long, illustrious history of going on the road and getting wins in the postseason. But I will say this. Teams are very, very different from any team that we've ever seen in the USL Championship. But taking that long of a winning streak or unbeaten streak into the postseason is dangerous because it's just a, it, it's just a mathematics game. You're not supposed to go that many games without losing. And, like, I'm one of those guys who's, like, you're due. Phoenix is due for a poor result, whether it be a draw or a loss at some point. Could they take it all the way? Sure, but it would defy the odds. This is a team that's proven to do that time and time again. But I would all, if I was a Phoenix fan, which, you know, I'm not a, I can't say I'm a fan, but I'm obviously very invested in the team. I would almost want them to draw a game or lose a game because then you know you sort of got it out of the way. The team sort of experienced what's that feel? They haven't experienced a poor result in months, in months. And, that's, and, and that can be a good thing sometimes, to feel that hurt. Because, you know, you hear it in sports all the time. Athletes hate losing more than they like winning. And there's, there's a difference between that. So, yep. that, with that, with that, listen, I'd love to see them take it all the way through. But that would literally defy, defy some laws of sports. You know, it's funny because uh, that's exactly what happened with the U.S. women's national team, right? Um, they needed that wake-up call to kind of get refocused. And I'm right there with you. I, I feel like uh, a kick in the pants makes you angry or makes you put out more effort, you know. So I would rather lose something in regular season and then, you know, make it through the championship than our luck run out, you know, when we go play somebody in the semifinal or something like that. Well, statistically, it's weird. So here's a question for you. One of my worries is, uh, Bacaro. He's not our player, right? He could be called back up, uh, up to Toronto. Yep. Um, anytime he's a, he is an integral part of, of what we're doing out there right now. Do you feel like we can fill in the holes adequately if, uh, if he gets called up? Um, if he get called, if he gets called up, yes. Uh, the only problem is that it might, it would might, it might take a game or two from an offensive standpoint. Right. I mean, he, he does so many good things for them on the ball. He's smooth. He, he, and his work rate defensively has just gone through the roof. And that was the biggest thing that we asked Rick, you know, right around when the winning streak started after the Orange County game. Like, what, what do you need more out of John Baccaro? Because he brings so much to the table offensively. He goes, I need to see him work harder on the defensive side of the ball. So with all of that said, yes, you can feel the pieces because that's what Phoenix did in the offseason. They spent money. They got good players. And you need to be able to plug and play, especially when lone guys go back to their parent club. However... Devin and I asked Rick this question in the last phone call that we had with them. They haven't spoken to Toronto in a long time. Now, the physios keep in contact with each other about John Baccaro's fitness and everything like that. But, like, Rick hasn't talked to Greg Vanny, the head coach of Toronto, in, in, in weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Just ignore him. He'll stay away. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, please forget about John Baccaro so we can stay here and win his USL Cup with Phoenix. But, again, like... John loves, loves playing in Phoenix. You see it. He's having literally the time of his life. He's posting on social media constantly. He's just like, he's embracing what it means to be a member of Phoenix Rising. And you don't normally see that from, from loan guys. Um, but being on loan at Phoenix means it's something different than being on loan for T2, being on loan for the Monarchs, whatever it might be. You, you feel that pride and passion from the fans and you just want to go out there and play for them and that's what you want when you send somebody on loan you want them to feel what it's like to play for a big club and 
whether it be LAFC or whoever it is, now clubs all over the MLS are going to be like, if we send guys to Phoenix, we know they're going to be in a professional environment. We know they're going to get used to winning. It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. So, yes, they can fill the role. Um, but right now, the conversations really have been few and far between between Greg and uh, Rick. That's good to hear. Uh, Toronto, just forget all about us. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, the Austin game, going back to that for a minute. Um, some people, some of the fans have been calling it the biggest game in Phoenix Rising history. I refuse to acknowledge that as truth because I was stuck on an airplane. And even worse, I had a person in front of me with a dog and I have flea bites all over my freaking legs. So I'm very, very, very bitter about that night. <laughs> um, but trying to take all that huge bias out of it, I look at the T2 game. And the victory that we were able to pull off and the way that we pulled it off. And I wonder, which of those two games is really the bigger game? Um, it's a good question. I mean, Austin Bold has sort of the lights and the spang dangle because it was dollar beer night. Bud Knight was in attendance. Um, he tied the record for, for consecutive wins in the USL championship. Um, but no, I think you're right. The T2 game is big because... It, it kept the streak alive, and it was a game in which Phoenix, along this road, um, in addition to the Monarchs game and the OKC Energy FC game, because Devin and I talked about it, we were like, of this winning streak, what games have they really, what what games have they really had to pull out some magic and get that lucky bounce here and there, whatever it might be? OKC, Monarchs, and T2 were the ones that that jumped to the top of the list. We were down two nil on the road at Real Monarchs. OKC Energy FC, you were winning, but you went down a man for the majority of the game. And then T2, you came back from a 2-1 deficit. And not only did you equalize, but you got the go-ahead goal and you got an insurance goal. Um, so with that said, I think, I think T2 is probably the bigger game because A, it kept the streak alive. I mean, all of these wins have obviously kept the streak alive. But like from, a, from an aura and like, you know, it, it almost feels like, you know, I hate to use this term, but it happens in sports, you know, and it's a, t it's a phrase that, you know, like we'll use during March Madness. Phoenix right now seems like a team of destiny. Their destiny right now seems to be to set this record. And you need some of those games where you sort of are just like, holy crap, how did they pull this out of their rear end? And yeah. T2 is one of those games. So with that said, I think that T2 is Austin was just a great, cool game because 6-0, 35, you know, plus goal differential. Bud Knight was in attendance, 7,300 pe uh, 7, people, not 73,000, it's not Mercedes-Benz. Um, <laughs> and it was just like, it, it was, everything came together to, you know, equalize the, the consecutive wins record. So T2 is the bigger game, in my opinion. Yeah. What, what happens on the pitch, the test of the medal of the team, to me, just add up to be a little bit more. Um, I mean, and I'm just insanely jealous that I wasn't there for the Austin game because uh, there was a spectacle. I mean, it was it, from everybody I talked to. It was just a huge spectacle and, and a lot of fun. Um, so, you know, we, we're seeing that we can come back from behind, which I think is good. Something that we did a lot last year, but I didn't think we had the same uh, – personality behind it the same hardness behind it that we have this year last year it was kind of like oh crap we're behind we gotta we gotta catch up and we did to our credit but this year it's like oh hell no yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we throw down um i was right by the goal uh when amadou dia uh headed that ball in and you know when you look at you look at these guys and you see their faces and what's going on on their faces, you know, up close, you can see how determined they are. It's like, yeah. he's a, he was a train. Nobody was going to stop yeah. that. Um, okay. One other question. And I want to make sure that I word this correctly because this is, this could come off poorly, um, which is normal for me. <laughs> so we have the um, golden ball contest that's going on, yeah. right? Solomon's in the lead. Out of those, out of the lead, I think, what is he at? 16 goals, 14 goals, something like that. 14. Um, he, uh, he has five PKs that contribute to that golden ball. Yeah. Do you feel like uh, PKs should be a part of earning a golden ball? Golden boot? Or boot, I'm sorry. Yeah, I knew there was something wrong with what I'm saying, golden boot. <laughs> um, it might be Yes, it, it always has to be a part of it, but it should, in my opinion, it should be part of the tiebreaker. If you, if, 
if Daniel Rios and Solomon Asante finish the season both on 23 goals, okay, and Solomon, let's say, has nine penalties and Rios has two, what's more impressive? Rios. Rios. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, it should be a part of it because you still have to convert penalties. I mean, how many, how many <clears throat> times have we seen players not convert penalties and be abominable from the spot? Um, so, yes, it should be a part of it. You're still scoring a goal. Listen, it's not like a penalty goal counts for anything less. It's not like it's two-thirds of a goal on the score sheet. It's still, you know, Solomon's penalties have still been the difference maker for Phoenix over the course of the year. And, I mean, how sure-footed is he from the spot? It, it, are you ever really in doubt that Phoenix is going to score from the spot? I mean, like, there are teams all over the world who may not have, a, a, you know, a knockdown penalty kick taker, and Solomon learned from the best. I mean, Rick told us that, you know, Solomon and Didier would spend hours after training sessions just figuring out different ways to hit penalties. I mean, yeah, it's great to hit the same penalty every single time, but if you're a guy that has four, five, six, seven, eight different pens in your bag, you're impossible to stop and impossible to predict. So, um, Well, he's added to that because he was going low left for a while there, and it yeah. became a little bit predictable, right? And yeah. all of a sudden, he pulled out center high, and I was like, whoa, what happened? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he learned that from Didier. He learned that yeah. from Didier. So, uh, yeah, it should, it should obviously be a part of it, but it should be a tiebreaker, in my opinion. Yeah, I like I like that. It's a good compromise. And I know you've got to go. You actually have a girlfriend. She's probably like, I got more coffee, and let's get out of here. Um, she did just make more coffee, but she's fine. She's doing her thing. She actually didn't even notice I was I was gone for these past <laughs> I don't think she really cares. By the way, you look like you're in the Matrix, because everything's just solid white behind you. I, I mean, actually, I could literally I, just put I, any I, background behind you I want to. Yeah, I took the red pill. Um, I'm in the Matrix. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so we talked about the uh, the PK thing, which is just an interesting thing to me. Um, I'm going to leave alone man of the uh, of the week, in, any of the of the week uh, contests. I'm just I'm just done with. Um, you're, you're over it. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's just an avalanche of, of fans, and if New Mexico's in the run, it's like what FC Cincinnati was last year, right? Yeah. It's just a sheer numbers game, and and I get it. We'd do the same thing if we could, so it's all good, but. It's meaningless, and and I think even with the players, they're like, well, it's nice, but you know, of the month is a lot more important. Although even that doesn't seem to be that important to uh, to the guys. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Solomon's double double? Incredible, probably the most understated thing that's going on in the USL Championship right now. Like, right? That that's is, what I say. That's it's ridiculous. It's absolutely oh. ridiculous. Um, I mean, yes, he got the majority of his goals at that standpoint from the penalty spot, but who cares? You still have to get the assists, and that's what's kept some guys from getting that in the past, um, most guys. Um, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's ridiculous. I mean, he's on pace to break the goals record and the assist record. Yeah. I mean, this is a guy, crazy. I mean, but this is a guy that, you know, and Devin and I have talked about this before. He was probably in better form last year. Even though he's got all these crazy numbers right now, he just looked like he was playing better soccer in 2018, which is scary. And again, this is a guy who I remember getting off a plane, uh, I forget where I was going. Oh, I think I was coming back from Montana. I was on a ski trip with a bunch of college buddies and, you know, all of the signings were rolling in for Phoenix and other teams around the league. And I saw that they re-signed Asante and I had already like had it in my head that he was going to get picked up, you know, like by a, by a team in, you know, Africa or Europe or MLS or whatever it yeah, might be. Sure. And they re-signed this guy. I'm like, what is going on right now? Like who, who doesn't want this guy? Uh, I it is. A, do you think it's his height? Do you think some of these teams, like in the MLS, they're just like, we need somebody with more height up front? I mean, he doesn't play up. He's not playing. He's not playing a number nine position. He's playing a wing or he's playing a ten. Yeah. He doesn't need to True be. Enough. But he's he's got a low center of gravity. It's tough to knock him on the ball. I mean, go ahead. You know, the rest of the world can think he's not, you know, fit and you know, big enough to play. You know, at a higher level. But you know, their loss Phoenix's game. I mean, that kid, that guy's ridiculous. He's he's on a different planet. His change of pace and change of direction is one of the scarier things to watch. And he's oh. a man amongst boys in that in that department. My girlfriend calls him the hummingbird because he's hummingbird. like, pew, 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 pew. <laughs> <laughs> she's Thai. She has weird stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things, because I've noticed, too, I thought, you know, it seemed like Solomon was in better form last year. But I started thinking about it. And when you watch the play. I think last year Solomon had to make up for DDA and Chris Cortez in the middle. He had to have that extra speed. He had to have that extra movement. He had to have everything because those guys, 
quality players, not taking anything away from them, but they didn't bring what Adam John's bring, especially when it comes to pace. And Adam John is not a speedster, <laughs> you know, but yeah. comparatively speaking, you see a lot more movement from Adam John. And then you throw um, Mustafa on the side. And when, when they're playing on the goal on stage right for you, uh, when you're up in the tower, yeah, they're streaking right in front of us. And watching those two communicate and allowing Mustafa to see and Solomon to see who's where and, and, and how they connect has, has been incredible. So, and then the last thing is his crosses this year have been clutch and just on point. I mean, that's why he's got those 10 assists. I bet out of those 10 assists, eight of them have got to be crosses uh, from the side of the field. Um, yeah. His cross to Dia was ridiculously accurate. Yep. Um, so I'm just excited he's here. I too think he w I thought he was going to be picked up and he wasn't. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I, I really wonder if we're going to see Kevon Lambert, if, uh, if he's going to be around after this season, it seems like somebody will pick him up, uh, yeah. somewhere. Um, so I appreciate your time. Uh, we've got a team that's in form and it's been a lot of fun. Um, I got slaughtered on Twitter for claiming that the team's a humble team and that's one of their, uh, one of their uh, attributes that's given the success they are. I stick by it though. Um, Dumbai or uh, Mustafa uh, yesterday actually agreed with me. He's like, yeah, yeah it's, it, there's no ego battles going on. We just seem to be gelling on all, on all fronts. Yep. Um, so you'll be calling the game with, uh, with Tulsa this uh, weekend. I'll yes. be listening. Yep, absolutely. And uh, it should be a, a firecracker of a game. These guys are going to be lit. Um, where, are you, where are you watching? Well, so we're just we're still trying to figure out if we're going to have our own watch party or if we're going to be um, over with the uh, Phoenix Rising. We're leaning with Phoenix Rising at um, Phillies in Scottsdale. Uh, uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, in fact, I'd say 80%. Yeah, we'll probably be at Phillies. All right. Uh, should be. We're going to live stream a little bit. Um, and... Uh, I gave you a shout out yesterday, actually, when I was talking to uh, Mustafa. <laughs> what was the shout out? What was the context of that? Well, you know, we were talking and I, I, I brought up um, that you guys were talking about the East West stuff and Phoenix Rising being on fire. And I said, it's this great podcast. And he's like, oh, I don't listen to podcasts. And I was like, if you listen to one podcast, <laughs> this is the podcast to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank yep. You. No, but I do really enjoy Three Honest Lads. It's just quality stuff. Um, you guys have taken me through some miserable plane flights <laughs> and turned them into something uh, much more enjoyable for sure. Um, so say hey to Devin for me and thank him for the quality stuff. And thank you for being on here. It's been way too long and I've just thoroughly enjoyed uh, talking with you. Me too. Glad to do it soon again. All right, Kev. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.